everybody, and welcome to the Downright Upright Show, the place to go to hear out loud and proud what Minnesotans are thinking. And I am your host, Philip Anthony. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you're all doing what? Fantabulous. You know what that is? Fantastic and fabulous. Put together, twice as nice saves time. Mm. That's what I like I to like say. That. So are you feeling fantabulous? I am feeling fantabulous you today. You look Fantabulous. Thank you. Complete. I mean, fantabulous is even not even enough of a word to, to describe <laughs> it. I appreciate that. <laughs> you betcha. So, oh, I just said you betcha. I think the Minnesota in me I is guess. coming out. Yeah, I guess. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you don't you know. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> my special guest today is Rachel Schroman. She's the managing attorney for the law firm Schroman Law, LLC. So hello, Rachel, and welcome to the Downright Upright Show. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, you bet. How are you feeling? Is everything going well? Yeah. Yeah. Despite the weather, I'm having yeah, a good it's, week. It's been a little dreary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, as usual, I'd like to ask uh, foundational questions of my guests, yeah. you know, so that the audience can get to know you a little bit better. Okay. Because I, I hardly even know you, but mm-hmm. I want them to know you. So um, would you tell the audience where you were born, raised, went to school, and any other memories during those times that you would like to share with the audience? So any personal anecdotes mm-hmm. you want to mm-hmm. throw in there? Yeah. Sure. I was born in Dubuque, Iowa, and I grew up in the country. Uh, our house was on 10 acres in between an apple orchard and a cornfield. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. So out in the country, uh, my dad was an excavator, and he owned an excavation company. So uh, I grew up running around, um, you know, backhoes, excavators, big equipment. We had a barn and a shop and all of that stuff. In fact, I think I was, gosh, I had to have been under one years old. (laughs) And there was a newspaper article uh, for Take Your Daughter to Work Day, and I was with my dad digging graves in the winter digging graves Graves. yep because he had the excavator and so he was out digging graves which my mom sent that article to me and i remembered the article but i kind of thought in my mind we were digging like a house foundation or something because that's Uh something he did mostly right and she sent it to me a couple years ago and in fact that day he was digging graves and the the articles about how you know my dad even though I was a young girl and this was in the eighties, even though she's a young girl, I want her to know she can do anything, even if it's excavation, but the tie between digging graves and what I do now with estate planning and end of life and doula work, um, was kind of interesting. I thought, well, gee, it did come full circle a little bit there. Oh yeah. There's a connection. Yeah, absolutely. So, so then I guess, do you think that had anything to do with it? I, or No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think that's more of a, a coincidence and just kind of a cool, um, uh, I call it like a universe moment where just something where I'm like, oh, wow, that seems like maybe a little more than a coincidence. But um, yeah, that was my growing up outside a lot. We didn't have cable TV. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it was it was good in that sense. We learned how to do a lot of things ourselves. Um, also a very, very, I was raised in a very, very conservative family. Um learned fiscal conservative skills, you know, personally, which was good, but um, the political leanings leaving Iowa, I left Iowa, went to college and considered myself a very, very staunch conservative, um, oh, really? which that got unwound. What with happened? My li- <laughs> well, I got a liberal college education, learned about um, empathy, I guess is what I'll say. At least in my experience, I, when I went to college, which I went to Winona state, um, I was a women's studies minor, women and gender studies, and initially started in social work. Mm -hmm. And in the social work route, there was a lot of just talking about humanity and people's stories. And so, for example, I remember being a freshman in college and the topic of, uh, homelessness came up and the idea that a homeless person perhaps was struggling with mental health or addiction or didn't have a perfect life and they weren't just lazy and making that choice not to work and live on the streets mm-hmm. was new to me at the age of 19. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a big misunderstanding about oh, homelessness. People just think, oh, you know, they don't want to work. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. But mm-hmm. no, it's it's definitely has to do with mental illness, right? It has to do with a lot of things. And I think trauma and 
growing up, just a lot of the messaging and a lot of the viewpoints and the opinions that I was surrounded in and my family and in my community and where I lived were just opposite of what I was exposed to later. And then I did a real fast 180 and, um, you know, here we are now. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So um, now let's go into your career as an attorney. Mm -hmm. You know, now, um, I don't know if I'm not familiar. I mean, I was a paralegal, full disclosure, yeah. but that's different than an attorney. I did personal injury, very easy stuff. Okay. You know, they, wow. they gave us form things and just filled in the, you know, the names and different things. But um, as an attorney, did you start in the general sense as an attorney or you you went directly into your field that you practice today? Explain that yeah. and, and how you got to be an attorney. So I'll, I'll even start back in college. So I was a social work major, women's studies minor, and I switched to law because a professor of mine essentially told me I'd be a great social worker for about a year. And she said, you're going to burn out real fast. And she said, part of the reason I think you'll burn out, Rachel, is in social work, what you might come to find is you can help people to a certain point, mm -hmm. but you're buttoned up against the laws all the time. And if you're an attorney, you can just kind of go a little further in the level you're able to help things and even do things that influence and change law. So I switched to pre-law with the intention of going to law school. I wanted to be a um, prosecutor. I wanted to prosecute domestic violence and sex crimes. Got to law school, realized litigation is not for me. Yeah. I do not have a litigator personality. It's really hard. It's isn't really it? hard. It's like, from what I'm hearing from my experience, mm -hmm. it's like you're acting because you have a jury there and you have to act to the jury. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think the performance, yes. I guess, is the word. 100%. Yeah. I mean, even doing, you know, mock trials or moot court or things like that, it felt similar to delivering a monologue. Mm. You know, when you're doing a closing argument, it felt I was in um, the vagina monologues in college. And so, really? yes, it was my only foray into acting. And <laughs> uh, when I was doing moot court and these, you know, all of that, it felt very similar to when I was rehearsing and practicing for monologue. And there's a lot more that goes into lawyering, of course, oh. um, and, and doing a trial. But the energy around litigation I'm so sensitive to and even working with clients that are perhaps even in an active trauma response I just didn't have the um, ability to boundary set or cope with some of that that it would have been a healthy career for me um, and I'm still working on some of that but I was in law school realized I didn't want to litigate, kind of looked around, wondered, why am I, why am I even in law school? Like, what am I going to do now? And a professor suggested that I take elder law um, as a course. And so I took that course. In fact, I had been volunteering in nursing homes since the age of 14. So I had always been drawn to serve kind of in that demographic and in that end of life space. Right, right. So I took elder law and realized, oh, this really does align with work that I care about and a passion that I have. Um, and just kind of followed down that path. Now, right out of law school, I knew I wanted to start my own practice and firm, but I also mm -hmm. knew I needed to work for a couple of years to, I don't know, make and save up some money <laughs> and to go out on my own and also just get some experience. And my first um, areas of practice that I worked in were bankruptcy, which was kind of a curveball, uh, but it was just the first job <laughs> that I got. I uh, actually loved it. A lot of my clients were elder individuals filing bankruptcy after a spouse passed away, um, filing on medical bills. Because in Minnesota, this is just kind of a side fact, we're one of the few states where spouses are jointly and severally liable for um, a spouse's medical debt. Uh-huh. Really? Oh, yeah. So oh, no. worked in bankruptcy, did that. Then I moved into insurance litigation. I... I don't know why. <laughs> it was not a great fit, right? But I got the experience. Now I can confidently say, nope, litigation definitely is not for me. And then um, eventually started Shroman Law and returned back to that estate planning and elder law focus, which I had um, been focused on in law school. Now you were end of life doula, you said as well, that you told me yeah. before the show. So mm -hmm. that also has a lot to do with um, 
what you're doing now with end of yeah. life, right? Yes. So can you tell, I, I don't know if my audience knows, even knows what that is. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. So, um, I practiced in a state law. My dad passed away uh, October 26, 2019. So it'll be four years tomorrow. He actually died on his 70th birthday. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was doing this legal work in the end of life space. Being with my dad when he passed was the first time I was with someone directly in that death and dying space. And that experience is what just led me to kind of deepen um the way that I'm of service in that space. And so I did end of life doula training about a year later. And what an end of life doula does, um, a lot of people know what a birth doula is. So I'll, I'll start with just explaining that because uh, they've been around. They're pretty well known. Uh, birth doula, a woman hires a doula. Her role is to just be with the woman giving birth, focused on her, focused on the birth plan. Um, if doctors seem like they're in the ru a rush, the doula just kind of can be a calming presence, can advocate mm -hmm. for the woman giving birth, etc. cetera. Um, after the baby comes, sometimes do, the doula will even provide support or bring meals or help clean for the family, etc. cetera. They're varying roles. Death doula, very similar role, different end of the life spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it's really about holding space, inviting people to be curious, uh, not scared or um, in denial of that end of life transition. One of the mottos that was repeated a lot when I did the training was we never look away. Mm -hmm. So it's someone who's with you and their role is to be with you in that transition, connected, supporting you, supporting the family. They don't look away. And that's not an appropriate role for family members necessarily. When I was watching my dad pass away, mm -hmm. you bet I needed to look away a few times. You bet I needed to step out of the room and take care of myself because there was a personal, I had my own things I was processing. Yeah. When I'm with someone and they're in, in their end of life transition, mm -hmm. uh, my role is to be with them. I don't have those things coming up. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I, it must be hard though. Um, I just, I don't know how you do it personally. I mean, I, yeah. I saying goodbye to people that you love or even mm -hmm. that, you, I mean, even if you don't know the person, you, you there, there is a connection with that yes. person. And I think, right? yes, absolutely. What's interesting is, you know, I look at, I met a woman um, this past weekend at a friend's baby shower and she's a defense litigator. And I went, oh my God, I don't know how you do that. And she goes, it, it just, um. I don't know. It mm -hmm. fits with me. Yeah. It sounds so stressful and overwhelming to me. People who work in the end of life space, most will tell you it really feels like a calling. It is. Yes. And when I was with my dad, when he passed, um, it was the most in my body I've ever felt. It was the most present in the moment I've felt. It was very, very hard, but it was one of the most beautiful spiritual experiences I've ever had. After he passed, I sat with my hands under his body for about an hour and I could just feel the energy in his body and I felt connected and at peace. That wasn't the experience of everyone else in that process, right? Mm -hmm. And the way that I was able to support family members, things that I was saying, I even kind of walked away and went, how did I know to say that? Mm -hmm. How did I remain so calm? Mm -hmm. Why was I moved to tears of joy and gratitude for the experience I just had with my father, not 100% pain and overwhelm? And I chalked it up to, we don't get to pick where we're meant to serve during this lifetime or what gifts we're given on this earth. And I leaned into it. Mm -hmm. All these things had kind of led me down the path already. Right. right. Um, and I just volunteer a little right now doing that. I mean, well, bless you. I don't know how you do that. I mean, you are, you know, it, only empaths could do this, you know, and yeah. I'm an empath. But the problem mm -hmm. is I'm I'm a little, I have, I don't have the courage you do. Because like oh. I said, I would probably get too attached to the person and mm -hmm. losing to one after the other like that would be yeah. damaging to me, I think. Well, I have to put but, a lot of time into... um 
boundary setting and being able to like protect my own energy. I mean, I definitely have invested a lot of time and money <laughs> into yeah. working with therapists and developing those skills so I can do this work. Yeah. yeah. Well, moving to the next question, yeah. would you tell the listeners what uh, particular fields of law you specialize in and why those are the fields you chose? Yeah. So my firm, um, offer services in estate planning and elder law. Um, that's wills and trusts, healthcare directives, powers of attorney. The elder law portion of our practice is largely helping families plan for medical assistance for long-term care. So how to protect assets um, or plan for long-term care costs in a way that doesn't just use up all the assets in the family legacy. We do estate and trust administration, so helping families after someone passes away. And then as kind of, we do a little bit of family law, but we only do prenups and postnups. So we don't do divorce law, but we do the pre-planning. Mm -hmm. And a couple things led me to that area of practice. One, wanting to serve in working with individuals, not always elders. I have a lot of young clients, um, but planning for that for end of life and holding space and creating conversation around end of life is mm -hmm. definitely a very strong personal passion of mine. Yeah. But I also attended a seminar um, or it was a conference, maybe my first year that I started my firm. Uh -huh. And they said, write down what you do for clients, not, oh, I, I give them a will or I, you know, right. provide legal services. What do you really give them in a meaningful way? And I sat and I reflected and I said, I give people a sense of security and a plan for a future and some sort of closure around something that's very unknown. Mm. And the woman said, what happened in your childhood to make you so passionate about that? And boy, did it connect to my childhood trauma. And so that's part of it too, is mm -hmm. personally, I grew up with a lot of um, chaos, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknown about what the future would hold, a lot of surprises um, that were very hard to process as a child, uh, a lot of not a strong sense of safety. Estate planning <laughs> mm -hmm. provides that, the opposite of that, right? So yeah, that's yeah. another, I think, reason I'm so passionate about it. Yeah, wow. Um, and also through my legwork, yeah. um, doing this show, preparing it for, to have, you know, Miss Schroman here on <laughs> my show, <laughs> I have discovered that you have a particular interest in helping veterans as well, mm -hmm. first responders, and terminal cancer patients. Mm -hmm, my God, mm -hmm. the empathy that you have is incredible. It's, mm -hmm. That's why I had to have you on my show. I mean, I was looking at this and, you know, God bless you, really. I mean, it's amazing work you're doing. Thank you. Um, can you tell um, us about those groups and the work that you do for them? Yes. Uh, veterans and first responders, there's a couple legal clinics that I've volunteered with. Mm -hmm. uh, Wills for Heroes is a pretty well-known one. They provide pro bono legal, pro bono estate planning um, to first responders. Uh, MACV clinic. It's a clinic for veterans that takes place at the veterans hospital. They provide all sorts of legal services across the board. Um, I've gone and volunteered doing what I do, estate planning for veterans. Mm -hmm. And then I volunteer with cancer legal care and they provide pro bono legal services again, across the board, um, to individuals with a terminal cancer diagnosis that qualify. So our firm, um, takes one or two pro bono clients a month and, of course, there's a lot of personal ties. Um, one of my best friends is a first responder. Um, well, was. She was in that field for a while. I watched her go through and process some of the trauma that comes with. She was a firefighter. Um, she was in high-risk situations. She had uh, colleagues die. Um, became passionate, more passionate than I was originally about that work. Uh, my dad was a veteran. Mm -hmm. He spent most of his life uh, an active alcoholic and an abusive alcoholic due to PTSD. He found recovery, got sober um, towards the end of his life, about five years before he passed away. Um, I have a lot, a lot, a lot of empathy um, for veterans, and I care very deeply about supporting them. Um, and then my mom's a cancer survivor. Um, mm hmm yeah, I haven't said this publicly yet, but as of this summer, I'm a cancer survivor. 
um, yep, melanoma. <laughs> um, and so oh, well, I shared with you that I am, yeah. I'm a double cancer survivor, but yeah. I was lucky both mm -hmm. times they caught it early. Um, mm -hmm. But it's scary. Same. It's scary. Hearing that word is very it, frightening. It is. And there's a grief process that happens um, yeah. with just learning it because your life changes. My life has oh, yeah. definitely changed. My summers are going, and, and it might seem trivial, mm -hmm. but my outdoor, you know, summers are going to look different. I will have skin scans two times a year. Um, what got caught looked just like a freckle and boy, I'm covered in them. So Mm -hmm. having, um, being able to offer those services to families. And when I work with, uh, cancer patients through cancer legal care, it's not uncommon that they've been given a terminal diagnosis. And when they can have this planning in place, what it does is it just gives them more space and more ability to be present with their family mm -hmm. and not worrying about, well, what are they going to be left with? What's the mess going to be? What's going to happen when and if I'm gone? Mm -hmm. And I care a lot about creating that space for families to be with each other and have that quality mm -hmm. time and not be robbed of it because they're worrying about getting legal things done or not being able to afford it and leaving a mess for their family. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's it's that diagnosis. Just hearing the word itself mm -hmm. is is such a jarring word you know yeah. i mean even though i was lucky twice i i buy uh you know i i, I missed the you know that the bullet missed me twice as mm -hmm. i like to say you know it's still scary because yeah. it could still there's a chance it can come back again you know and yeah. i have to go through the whole yes. rigmarole again so um yeah also through my legwork i found you have an interest in helping women who were victims of domestic abuse now mm -hmm. um my mother and i um were victims of domestic abuse because of my stepfather. Mm -hmm. um, she was an old fashioned Italian woman yeah. who, you know, the man is the, you know, the king of the castle kind of thing. I, I'm, I don't know if your parents were like that too, but mm -mm. they were old fashioned Catholic. You know, mm -hmm. the man is, you know, mm. runs run, Italian, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You know, and my mother was, you know, she listened to him and she did everything he said. And she, he, he kind of was attracted to that um, mm -hmm. subservient, subservient uh, kind of personality, I guess. Yeah. And when they got married, everything changed. He became very abusive, called her every name in the book, smacked her around, ripped her clothes. Mm. Um, and it was traumatic for me as a child too because mm -hmm. you know i'm i'm around it and he would threaten me so i'm going to kill your son you know in front of her mm -hmm. to stress her out and mm -hmm. get her upset mm -hmm. so a domestic abuse is is personal to me mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. thank you again for yeah. your your work in that um in that field i guess mm -hmm. um can you share some of your experience that you've had you don't have to name names i'm just yeah. experiences that you've come across in your uh, field of study about and, and, and around domestic job. violence. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um I mean it's personal to me as well. Uh, I won't go into a ton of detail about that. Um but I've lived it. Mm -hmm. And so it's personal to me um as a woman, you know, domestic violence, sexual assault, those go hand in hand for me. Um I'm a survivor of sexual assault. Uh I think every and I am not exaggerating when I say this, every woman I know is a survivor of sexual assault. And it is so pervasive. It is so common. Mm -hmm. um, things that are considered normal in a relationship in our society are abusive. Things that happen to women that they don't recognize as actually sexual assault. Uh, yes. Gosh, working in bars in college and having, you know, a hand go up my skirt or just things that would happen that you think, oh, it's part of the job. No, you're it's just not part assaulted. of the job. No. Yeah. Mm -mm. Um. Very, very personal to me. And I have a uh, good friend and colleague, Yvonne Spangler, um, who founded the Domestic Abuse Legal Advocacy Center uh, in 2016. And it's a it's essentially a nonprofit law firm. And they have this is the only model like this that I know of in the country. They go into domestic violence shelters and provide pro bono legal clinics to the women in the shelters. So talk about providing a free service that's safe and accessible. Oh, wow. um, and then they provide pro bono in-court representation for orders for protection and eviction expungements. 
Uh, I've volunteered with the organization since it started, um, helping Yvonne to get it up and going, uh, doing in-person, doing the clinics directly with volunteering. Uh, right now, a lot of my involvement is fundraising. <laughs> um, I do a lot of fundraising for the organization um, and helping with clinics and recruit volunteer attorneys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and and again, you know, being that I uh, was a child when this, it, it doesn't make it any less of a no. scar in my, you know, and, and I mean, there's a lot of personal issues that I went through. I had to go see mm -hmm. help, seek help as well. Oh, God, absolutely. My mom, actually, it's funny. Um, and even though it's not a funny issue, it, it's mm -hmm. funny. My mother worked in a psych, uh, uh, in the mental health center in a hospital in New York. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so she had access to mm -hmm. psychologists. So after the divorce, after she divorced him, um, she sent me for help because she saw it was really affecting me. I, I would, I'd be every yeah. little noise, I'd, I'd jump and uh, screaming used to, you know, you know, make me uncomfortable, and mm -hmm. I would get, you know, I'd cower and. Mm -hmm. It wasn't normal. So, um, well, in children who witness domestic violence, the chance that they will end up in a relationship that has domestic violence, whether they are the victim or the perpetrator, mm -hmm. real high. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they're referencing when they talk about the cycle. So, the fact that you were able to get help as a child and hopefully break that cycle into that's massive. Oh my goodness. That doesn't happen for a lot of kids. And that's a big yeah. reason, you know, Yvonne and I are so passionate about that work. You no, know, I don't I don't know where I would be today if I didn't my mom didn't send me for help because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a very amazing husband mm -hmm. um never put a hand on me or anything. Yeah. But he has he, he'll 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 raise his voice, you know, like anybody else, you know, yeah, when yeah. you're when you're stressed out, you know. Mm -hmm. But um there's so much love between us. So it's yeah. not, um, yeah. I mean, I don't know where I'd be. And I don't want to think about that. Right, right. It's, it's, it's it, and, and, and it's funny because when I go back to that time, it's very cathartic for me. It's almost mm. like I can, I can, um, I can see where I, where, well, if I, it was almost like a fork of the road. I could have gone this way, yes. but I went that way. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, you're so amazing. Oh, oh my God. You. I'm a big fan. I'm sorry. Thanks. You're just building a big me fan, up. A big yeah. fan. Um, and these are very serious issues. I don't mean to make light of it, but, you know, um, it's it's something, you, I mean, sometimes you do have to, in in the eyes of the, um, you know, uh, adversity, you mm -hmm. have to try to build it up and try to get through it. And sometimes humor works. That's mm -hmm. what worked mm -hmm. for me. That's why I'm a silly yes. person today. Same. I've never been like that as a kid. I, I, my mother would, would, would say, you're too shy. You have to be more friendly and mm -hmm. you, you go out and play with the kids. I didn't want to play with kids. Sometimes if I did play with kids, it was mm -hmm. girls because boys didn't like me. So, and then I grew up and, and all that help that I got and then yeah. coming out of the closet and being who I am, I, I, I started to become silly. And I think yeah. that's my defense mechanism, I think. Well, I saw it. I, I laugh because I relate to this, but I saw a meme or, you know, recently online that said, um, so are you funny or did you have a good childhood? <laughs> I thought, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm real funny. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, yeah. you know, most comedians, they say they had, a, they come from broken families or, yeah. or abuse. Yeah. So again, um, mental health, again, is, is an issue that you, that resonates with you. Mm -hmm. But as a gay man, I remember having to deal with it with the fear of coming out <clears throat> mm -hmm. and mental anguish that I went through and abuse and bullying mm -hmm. and all that. Um, a lack of mental health access in the uh, LGBT community is a huge problem nowadays. Do you have any personal stories you'd like to share about helping someone that went through a terrible ordeal in their sexual orientation or with their sexual identity? Hmm. Or, or make a general you know, yeah, yeah. Um, talk about it generally, I guess. <clears throat> well, I would say, um, I mean, I grew up, I went to high school in the early 2000s, and we had a rainbow club, you know, and things were starting to be, I think, more accepted. Mm -hmm. I also grew up in a smaller town in Iowa that was very, very conservative and very Catholic. Um, Catholic? Yeah, big Catholic community, oh, wow. ton of Catholic schools, lots of Catholic churches. Um, I had, I was in the Rainbow Club, um, and I had a number of friends who were gay. There weren't a lot of out gay kids <laughs> in high school. 
Um, one of them, real sad story, uh, and I won't name names or anything, but he, his parents were very, very religious and he actually got sent to conversion camp. And in high school, the struggles with not being accepted and all of that, he turned to alcohol and drugs, um, got in a car accident. Someone died in the car accident. He ended up in prison. Mm. And, you know, the narrative around it was around his alcohol and drug use. But having known him and kind of seen what he lived, there's this 19, 18, 19 year old in prison. And I'm looking at the fact he grew up in a household that didn't accept him, that um, condemned him, that sent him to conversion camp and conversion therapy. It was just absolutely awful. Uh, and I think that's why he ended up. I do too. Where he where he is being incarcerated because again, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, there were kids I grew up with, you know, uh, back in the day that ran away from home and lived in the streets, or they yes they would live in these um, it was a hotel in the in the village where the mm -hmm. uh, you know runaway kids would go and you know older older gay men would house them and help them out and it was just yes. You need support, you know, you, you, you know, mm -hmm. um, I understand you have religious feel, you know, a, a religious background, but you know, God also, Jesus also said, you know, love thy neighbor mm -hmm. and, you know, you, these are your children, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> so the, the final question before the shift, mm -hmm. I noticed that your law firm employs many women, um, and you love to empower women. Can you talk a little bit, a bit briefly about that? Yeah. I. Uh... Well, it wasn't why it ended up that yeah, way. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I it, not necessarily something I went into super in, intentionally. Um, however, I'm also not surprised that my team is all women. Uh, I was a women's and gender, gender studies minor. Um, I'm a feminist. I've been involved in Minnesota women lawyers. Um, I network almost primarily with women. Um, again, just because that's what I'm drawn to. I have a huge passion for helping and supporting other women. Part of that is really just paying it forward because I had so much help and support myself. Um, you know, I, I talked to a attorney the other day, a female attorney who's thinking about going solo, starting her own practice. And she said, I just, you're just so brave. I don't know how you did it. You're so strong when you started your business. And I went, I had so many women on speed dial that I would call when I was having a panic attack, sitting at my house going, I can't do this. I don't know what I'm doing. Who am I to think I can build a law firm? And I'd call them and they'd say, Rachel, you're fine. You are going to be great. What yeah. questions do you have? We'll help you. And so I've always passed that on. And when I've been growing my practice and I've started, I've never had a job listing as I've grown my firm. I've just kind of mentioned, hey, I need an office coordinator. And I put the word out there and the people that are approaching me have been women. Because uh, women, women like that. It's a safe space for women. Yes. You know, they don't feel that there's any th threats to you know, sexual harassment, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Or any, you know, those just kind of gender undertones that come up of, right. um, you know, being accused of being bossy or whatever things you can still find in the workplace. Absolutely. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other attorney at my firm, Melissa Miroslavich, um, she's the newest attorney that I've hired. Uh, she approached me about coming to work for me. And she wow. loved that was an all woman team. She loved kind of the approach that I take with employees of empowering them to have a career that's fulfilling, actually listening to what excites you. What are you passionate about? Um, what do you want your career to look like within Shroman Law? And how can we work to achieve that while also doing what we need to do for Shroman Law? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's really just how I would want an employer to work with me <laughs> exactly. and treat me and provide for me. Yeah. So yeah. now we have come to the part of the show I like to call the shift yeah. and, and we're, we, we're, we're like going long here. So I'm going to oh, try, we're we? going to do a lightning round on these questions. Oh, okay. All right? So, um, so we shift the, the reason it's called the shift is because we yeah. shift the questioning away from your personal journey yep. as an attorney and we to get serious. Yeah, opinion. Okay. Current events. Yeah. You know? yeah. And make sure you pronounce that F in shift because otherwise shift. We, we have a problem. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> so being that you are an attorney, I was wondering if you haven't uh, followed the upcoming trials of the former president and if you've uh, had any opin opinions about any of them, especially the Georgia trial where Sidney Powell, Kenneth Cheeseborough, uh, Jenna Ellis, yada, yada, mm -hmm. it seems that the, the house of cards falling. 
uh, have pled, uh, have pleaded. It's, it's pleaded, not pled. I learned that in, oh, okay. in, in, law, in pre-law. <laughs> yeah. Um, guilty. <clears throat> What what's in store for the former president now that these three members of the conspiracy are pleading guilty? And do you think that will be helpful to the prosecution? Yeah, well, yes, I have followed it. Um, coming off the topic of mental health, I follow these things at somewhat of a distance because, boy, can I go down a rabbit hole and it is not good for my mental health with this stuff. Um, I think a lot of people can relate to that with what an absolute nightmare um, that presidency was and continues to just haunt us. Um, so very interesting that they pleaded guilty. Um, the fact that they're pleading and not getting jail time, I think speaks to what they know or what they're going to offer the prosecution, which will That's be, what I say. Yeah. oh yeah, it'll be really, really, really interesting to see. Because they wouldn't accept a, uh, they wouldn't give them an offer of no. a plea deal if they didn't have inf important information that would exactly. help their case, right? Oh yeah, yeah, that's, and it's a big deal. It's yeah. a big deal. They're not getting jail time. So, um, oh yeah, I think especially be... Jenna Ellis, she was like uh -huh. running around with with Giuliani and spreading yep. the, you know, the yeah the lies about the election. And... Yeah, I don't think it'll bode well for uh, Mr. Trump, and um, I think it'll be good for the prosecution. I'm definitely interested to see what comes from that. Yeah. And uh, also we haven't had a speaker of the house mm -hmm. for uh, how many weeks? Now? Uh, <laughs> I've lost track. Yeah, seriously. Hello, speaker of the house. Anybody want to be the speaker? Maybe Brett will be the speaker of the house. I don't know. Somebody will do yeah. it. Um, do you want to be speaker of the house, Brett? Uh, not under the Republicans. No, <laughs> right. just kidding. So after McCarthy vacated the chair and then Scalise and Jordan and, uh, Emmer, and, and now they've nominated this guy named Mike Johnson. The only thing I know about him is he doesn't like the gays. Mm -hmm. He doesn't mm -hmm. like LGBT people. So what do you say about this whole fiasco, this flood? I call it a fuster cluck. Yeah, well, fiasco <laughs> and fuster cluck are <laughs> It's a dyslexic version of the other, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it... I, I don't know how the Republican Party can be anything but embarrassed about oh, it's embarrassing. what totally an absolute fiasco it is. Yeah. Um, I'm not surprised. I, I think, think it's going to guarantee mm -hmm. the Democrats take back the House. It's got to. Because mm -hmm. why would you vote for a party that's not doing? We, 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 right. have, we have an issue with the, um, you know, the we have a lot of things going on. We have Israel. We have the... Mm -hmm. um, the debt ceiling, you know, all of this stuff. You yeah, know, we have and they to fund can't get the their act together. Yeah, and they can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question here is: uh, uh, Senator Tommy Tuberville has sent uh, has held back military promotions because of the new abortion policy that would pay military personnel to travel to their home state to pursue reproductive health care, but the policy does not fund abortions. It's just to get the yeah. child bearing person or the woman to their home mm -hmm. to seek women's health care. Mm -hmm. So the defense, a uh, defense secretary Lo Lloyd Austin um, ordered the defense department to allow troops and their dependents to be able to travel to pursue this health care. Mm -hmm. So what say you about these senators actions? He's also damaging, really putting us in danger. We don't have, um, people mm -hmm. in, in, in in leadership positions in the military because he's holding them back just because of that. He doesn't want people to travel to get uh, health, yeah. women's health care. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to say you? obviously, but maybe it's not obvious. I don't agree with it. <laughs> well, yeah. I obviously don't agree with it. Um, it seems, I, I believe women should have control over their bodies. They should have access to the health care they need. And if under our current laws and how everything is running, that means they need to travel to their home state, mm -hmm. then that needs to be um, available to them. It also seems bizarre. And now I haven't researched the laws or regulations or anything behind this, but even just on a high level, it seems like an abuse of power. Like I even imagine yeah. as an, em an employer to just say, to, you know, put, put a stance down that, well, None of this is happening until we stop providing something that I don't believe in. Mm -hmm. Bizarre. Do your job, man. Yeah. You know, do your job. You're, you were elected to do yes. a job. Agreed. And and our military is very important. I mean, if uh -huh. we don't have leaders in our military, you know, people, you know, that in the know, that people that know what they're doing, mm -hmm. it could become a, you know, a fuster cluck. Yes. As I Agreed. Said before. <laughs> um, so, um, 
before we close out the show, and we have a lot of time still, so I guess we went through okay, the lightning we round. The lightning, really, lightning, lightning, we, yeah. we really lightninged, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is good. Um, is there a topic that we haven't mentioned that you would like our listeners to know about um, that you're passionate about and you would like to talk about? Because I want to learn myself. Um, I know there's a, you, you, you've mentioned mental health, mm -hmm. women's abuse, um, uh, elder care. Um, and, yeah. uh, can you talk about those, any of those other issues or, well, maybe, or, exas uh, or, or elaborate yeah. on what you talked about before? Well, th those are all things I'm very passionate about, um, largely due to personal ties and experiences. Uh, but another issue that uh, there's actually legislation um, that's been uh, moved in Minnesota uh, as of this past March around uh, green burial and furthering availability of that in oh Minnesota. Oh my God, that's Angela Woosley. She was on yes. my show. Yes. So Angela Woosley, she's a local um, uh, end of life doula and she has a, much more than that. She's a funeral director. She's a mortician. She's taught at the U. She's very, very passionate Could you about believe this she as well. was on my show. I was passed out. I know. You told me. I'm like, oh my God. She's I one actually of the coolest saw, people I know. I know. I actually mm -hmm. saw her on PBS. She yeah. was doing a show about end of life and and, and burials and all that. And my husband and I are sitting there. He goes, oh, I know her. She's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I said, well, could you get her on my show? Yeah, she's a powerhouse. And yeah. this uh, legislation is around natural organic reduction, uh -huh. which is, to put it in layman's terms, um, composting. Yeah. Of human remains. Right, right. And right. I am a huge, massive advocate for it. Uh, if you research it, and if you want to talk about green burial, composting, earth to earth with human body, um, that's about as green as it gets, in my, you know, in my opinion. Uh -huh. um, and it's it's great for the environment. I think it's a huge move in the right direction for sustainable green burials. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not legal in Minnesota right now. And so that legislation is um, in front of uh, Minnesota legislatures that legislators this year, and I feel very passionately about it, and I hope it passes. Mm -hmm. um, it's starting to pass in other states, um, Washington, Oregon, I believe, California, I think Colorado. What uh, do those states all have in common that, that, that you just named? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yes, I do. If you don't vote, people, yeah, this is what happens. Yes. You, you know, I mean, and she, when she was on my show, she was talking about water, water burial. Yes. Yeah. And did she ever talk to you about that? Yes. And that's something that, oh, wow. you know, I have clients that come into my office and they care about the environment. They care about green burial and they say, I want a green burial. I really want, you know, not to negatively impact the earth. I want to return to the earth. And then they bring up things that. I'm going to be quite frank. I believe marketing has misled us to believe is more green than it is. So an example, um, mm -hmm. water burial has come out and they say, well, this is more, this is better for the environment than your typical burial. Not really, mm. actually. Um, this whole, I want to be turned into a tree. People think it's very green. Well, my body will be turned into a tree. The company, cremate, People say they that? cremate. Well, what the company does is they cremate you. They put your cremains in with a soil of a tree that's going to be planted uh -huh. but cremains are just your bones right that's that's not composting that's not giving nutrients to that tree it's a uh it looks green but it's not necessarily right and so as we move into getting more laws passed to give more options for what is green burial and people educate themselves and learn what is green what does this actually look like now you have to get past. There's a lot of people that don't want to learn about this and don't want to talk about it. Like it's kind of ooh, like I don't want to read it's about gruesome. It. Yes, it can seem very overwhelming. And don't even get me started on how our society treats the topic of death and and this topic, right? It's Halloween, it's, so I guess that's, yeah, that, we can, that's we can go down the we path. We can go down that path. <laughs> we have we have carte blanche now. Yeah, <laughs> so. but learning about it, I think, is really important because it opens up what's available to us. It um, expands our options, and it really gives us some more truly green options um, that but, are going to be good. But for people the world. are burying people though with form formaldehyde in their bodies. Mm -hmm. That that's not good for the environment, right? No, no. Or so when you're talking about yeah. you know land burial as opposed to water, mm -hmm. um, that 
that that chemical is not correct. It's not green. Well, and even green right. burial in Minnesota, which it's limited, um, the availability of it, you can be buried in a green manner where you don't have a casket. Maybe you're just shrouded or put in a bamboo basket. Um, the land is kept natural and maybe they have prairie restoration, but you can still only bury one body per plot, uh -huh. which how does that work with land use? Yeah. You know, there's just... Europe is doing it differently. There's a lot of different things that are just a lot more green and again, more, more sustainable, but the laws have to change to but, allow that. Yeah. So isn't the answer really cremation is, 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 is the most um, environmentally friendly way to, to, to. Um, it's, it's a potentially more environmentally friendly way, but the natural organic reduction, I think, if you look into it and learn about it. So what? So that's just basically putting the body in the ground. And that's well, it. no. There's other things going on there? So there are, a lot of these places doing it are composting the body in, um, I'll use the word pods. So there's a company um, called- Recom A pod? Mm -hmm. P-O-D? Yep. Mm. There's a company called Recompose. Katrina Spade started it. She's another rock star. Um, she's out on the West Coast. And she designed these pods that a body goes into. Mm -hmm. They put in organic material with the body. They introduce certain bacterias and whatever. They keep the pod at a certain temperature and then they rotate it. And within, I think it's a week or two or a few weeks, they have compost. Mm. And then that compost is put back into the earth. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And there aren't emissions. There aren't, it, it's really, really cool. There's, I read an article about a guy. I don't remember a lot of specifics, but there's a guy in Colorado doing this in wine barrels. Wine barrels. Yes. But, uh, you, but you have to go to a specific place to, to have this uh, service yes. done, right? Yes. And. Because not everybody's doing it. Basically. No, because you know? it's not legal. But once it's legalized and we get these companies that are offering it, it's a really, really, really cool, beautiful, natural option that can be available uh -huh. to families and yeah, to yeah. individuals. My last <laughs> question to you before we end the show, because yeah. I can go on with you yeah. forever. Uh -huh. You're amazing. Um <laughs> When you talk about end of life, because this is, I don't know how the show became more of about end of life, but um, because you have such a storied career about different, you know, mm -hmm. I could go down every avenue here. <laughs> but I'm fascinated with this. Um, legalized suicide, legal suicide mm. that happened. Uh, certain states are have legalized that. What Do you have a final opinion about that? I Quickly. Be, yes. We have a minute Quickly, here. quickly. Yeah. Um, I think it should be available to individuals. I think it gives them control, um, gives them a say, uh, allows them to be a more active participant at end of life. Um, I think it can allow people to die with dignity. Do we have assisted suicide here in Minnesota? No. Well, it's not legal mm -hmm. yet, right? Not yet, no. Well, I'm surprised we didn't push it. It's wonderful, I think, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if I was suffering beyond recognition and I couldn't take it, um, yeah, it's just, you know, we, we, we do it with animals to, to be to humane. Right. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Rachel. Yes, so thank you for having much. Me. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Why would you, was it fun? Oh, so much fun. Yes. Yeah. And, and you, 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 you're just full of information. I could just, the show is only 50 minutes. I could, mm -hmm. it, it could have gone on for two hours. Yeah. But yeah, but we, maybe you can come on again. I'd love to. Another day. We could talk about happy other to. things. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So, um, it's been a great pleasure. I, I just keep saying that because you you are amazing. You're an amazing empath. Thank you. Um, and we need more empaths in the world. Agreed. We do. And to the listeners, hi, listeners. Thank you so much for um, joining us today and joining Rachel and I in our conversation. And um, we also want you to um, sub- we want you to click, do whatever mm -hmm. you can to support the show. And my name is Philip Anthony. And on behalf of the Downright Upright Show, I'd like to say bye for now. Ciao for now. You could wave in your okay. camera. Oh, yeah. Just, just, can we bye. just wave? We would, like my fan? Yeah. <laughs>